Hello um, everyone, good evening and welcome to uh, this evening's Cancer Chatters um, exercise and webinar, um, exercise and cancer um, series, um, series of webinars that we have um, holding. Um, I would like to firstly um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet this evening. Uh, I would also like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and offer my acknowledgement and respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present. Um, we encourage you to ask questions um, at the end of this, the presentation, and you can submit your questions at the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will monitor that as we um, go along. An online evaluation survey will be sent around after the event, um, and we do encourage you to complete this um, so we can continue to improve our education events um, in the future that we provide you. Um, our guest speaker tonight, I'm pleased to introduce, is uh, Gillian Gregory. Jill is a senior physiotherapist working at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in haematology and oncology. She has been in this role for seven years and she works with patients in uh, varying stages of their cancer treatment uh, from new, newly diagnosed diagnosis to more advanced metastatic cancers. She last year completed her PINC uh, cancer rehabilitation training and Jill has a passion for cancer rehabilitation and its role in assisting patients to improve and build their physical function and quality of life. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jill. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I'll just get my PowerPoint slides up so everyone can see. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for that. And I just want to start by saying thanks to Shannon, Melissa and Kate for inviting me along to speak tonight for um, the Cancer Council. Uh, they've got some great resources so hopefully you can all have a look at their website and see there's lots and lots of stuff on there about many topics so um, thanks again for having me. I am going to speak tonight about exercise and cancer which is actually a very broad topic. Um, as Shannon said my background is um, at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and I predominantly work in inpatients so seeing patients who are admitted to the hospital but what I hear a lot from my patients is that exercise, when you have a diagnosis of cancer, can be quite a scary thing for them. And also people don't quite understand the benefits of exercise during their cancer journey. So hopefully I'll be able to explain some of that tonight um, and I will get started. So this is a bit of a summary of what I'm gonna speak about tonight. So I'm going to start by talking about what exercise is and the different forms of exercise that we would want you to include in any sort of exercise program. I'm going to talk about the benefits of exercise for people that have a diagnosis of cancer. And then I'm going to talk through some of the ways that exercise can help you at varying stages through your cancer journey. So I'll start with prehabilitation, which is exercise prior to surgery then exercise during your cancer treatment. And I guess this is where I'm most familiar with working with inpatients. So talking about how exercise can help you through chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiotherapy, and also through hormone therapies. I'll be talking a bit about the safety aspects of exercise because there are some things that we want you to be aware of and how you can exercise safely. I'll talk about exercise and its role in cancer prevention and recurrence. And then some common questions as well and where to access further community support if you want more information to help you to feel safe and to get started on an exercise program. So I just wanted to put a disclosure statement together. Uh, exercise and cancer is a great topic, but it's also very broad. So without knowing each of you and your individual cancer diagnosis, it's um, hard to put a presentation together for each of you. So this is just general information on exercise. And we would recommend that if you are starting an exercise program or if you're unsure about what you can and can't be doing, that you speak to someone who has experience in um, treating exercise 
through a cancer patient. So this is someone with a background in cancer and exercise, so either a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist, um, just to help you through those initial stages of getting the right program for you. I think it's really important when you do go to see your physio or your exercise physiologist that you ask about their background in cancer and their experience in treating patients with cancer. This is something that some of my patients tell me they don't feel comfortable doing, but if you were going to see a doctor, you'd want to know what their background is. And I would say the same. There are some um, great professionals out there who, for instance, might work with sports, but we want to make sure that um, people have a good understanding of cancer and the treatments that you're on. So um, that's something I'd encourage you to speak to your um, therapists about. So what are the ex exercise recommendations that we recommend for people who have a diagnosis of cancer? They're actually the same as what we would recommend for general population. So we get our guidelines from the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia and also from the American College of Sports Medicine. And what they both recommend is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise a week or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous exercise. Within that, there should be two sessions of resistance or strength training. And I think 150 to 300 minutes can sound like a lot, but when you break it down, it's actually really only about 30 minutes a day for five days of the week. Or if you prefer slightly longer sessions, you can look at three lots of 50 minutes. So there are a number of things we want to make sure that you're getting in an exercise program. Uh, there's four main types of exercise that I think should be included. So the first is aerobic exercise. These are the exercises that typically make you huff and puff. So running, swimming, uh, cycling, all those sorts of exercises. The next is resistance exercise. So um, you might hear this termed as strength training. So this can be using things like dumbbells, um, TheraBand, gym-based machine weights, or even your own body weight. Then we want to include some flexibility and stretching exercises. So this is particularly important for people that may have had surgeries where their um, muscles are a little bit tighter or sometimes post radiotherapy as well. We know when you get radiotherapy to a site, the tissues over the top of that can sometimes also get tight as well. So stretching is important for those populations. And the last one I think is probably the one that's most overlooked is postural type exercises. So what we know about people who have cancer and what the research shows is that between one third and two third of cancer patients are inactive. So they don't meet the recommended guidelines for physical activity. We also know that um, the therapies you have, so chemotherapy, surgeries, often make you feel quite unwell. So people tend to rest more, lie in bed more, recline in chairs more. And this can make our postural muscles, so the muscles around our tummies and backs, shoulders and hips, quite weak. The other thing is steroids are a common part of many treatments. And again, steroids in high doses can cause weakness around your backs, hips, shoulders and core. So including some exercises to work on the postural muscles that would normally keep us upright and in a good posture during the day is really important as well. And this is quite a busy slide, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but what I wanted to demonstrate is that um, the research shows us that there are many, many, many benefits of exercising during your cancer treatment. In fact, there are over 900 articles that can show the benefits of exercise for cancer treatment. Some of the ones that come to your mind straight away are things like improving your strength, improving your bone health, improving your physical fitness. And then there are some of the ones that don't come to your mind um, as quickly. So we know that exercise can be helpful to improve your sleep, improve your fatigue, so improve your energy levels and reduce your fatigue, um, reduce your risk of falls, give you shorter stays in hospital, so reducing your hospital length of stay, as well as improving your memory and thinking. So there's lots of research now coming out about um, exercise and the role it has in cognitive function. The other thing we know is that along with exercise, excessive sedentary behaviour, so periods where you're lying down and you're inactive for long periods, is also detrimental to people with a diagnosis of cancer. So while exercise is important, the other thing we want to encourage is that you avoid really long periods and protracted periods of lying down or reclining. 
obviously if you're having a day where you're feeling really unwell you maybe had chemo a week ago and you're just feeling rotten it's fine to lie down on those days but just generally over over when we look at you know weeks at a time we want to make sure that you're maintaining activity and I'll talk about that a bit more later on this slide just talks a little bit about fatigue and again I'll talk to this a little bit more in a bit more detail later but what is sometimes spoken about is this cycle of inactivity or the cycle of fatigue that we see with cancer patients. So we know that a huge number of patients, some of the literature quotes up to 70% of patients will experience some cancer related fatigue. So this is where you're so tired and it's just not alleviated by rest. So you can rest and you just still feel tired. Some of my patients say they feel tired in their bones. And what happens when you get this is you tend to rest excessively. When you rest excessively, you then start to become weak and um, lose some of your fitness. And then you start to get tired doing the activities that you previously had the fitness to do before. So you rest more, you become weaker and lose that fitness and then you rest more. And that cycle continues round and round until sometimes I'll see patients admitted to the hospital where they get tired just getting out of bed to a chair. So the role of exercise in improving your energy levels is to reduce that physical deconditioning component. I'll just see if I can move my mouse um, there and to help improve your strength and maintain your fitness so you don't get that continued cycle round and round. Timing. So without knowing any of you that are listening, um, when is the best time to start? I would say now. So the research shows us that exercise is beneficial to patients with a diagnosis of cancer at any point on their cancer journey. So this can be from right at the start to maybe two years after they finish their treatment. Again, what some of my patients tell me is they get this fantastic news, you know, you're in remission, the cancer is gone, but they still feel like they're a shell of their physical selves. So they just don't have that strength and that fitness that they had before. So doing some of those activities that brought them joy become really difficult. So we know exercise can be helpful at the start, but also at the end, maybe when you've got some good news, the cancer is gone, but you're still struggling to get back to those activities you were before. We also know that even patients that have very advanced metastatic disease still show benefits from including some exercise into their daily um, activity um, regime. I'm going to talk a bit now about prehabilitation. So this is quite a hot topic at the moment. There's lots of research coming out in this area. So prehabilitation refers to the period um, before patients have their surgical resections for cancer. So we're really, really lucky at Sir Charles Gardner. We've got a great physio who runs prehabilitation classes and she runs them mostly for colorectal cancers um, and gynecological cancers. Um, we've also got some lung patients that will go into our pulmonary rehab classes before their surgeries as well. So what we do know is that um, prehabilitation, so again at Charlie's we do four to six weeks of exercise twice a week prior to the surgery, can help to reduce your hospital length of stay, so reduce the amount of time you're in hospital, and it can also help to improve your preoperative fitness and function. So as I said, there's lots of research coming out in this field uh, more and more every day, but the strongest evidence really lies for patients that have colorectal cancer, gastroesophageal cancer, urological, liver, lung and pancreatic, but there's more coming out in other cancer types as well. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about exercise during your cancer treatment. And this is where I do see some patients have a bit of um, apprehension and fear around what they can and can't do. So hopefully the next few slides will help to give you some clarity around that. So chemotherapy, we know that chemotherapy has been proven to be safe um, with exercise. So you can exercise safely while you're having chemotherapy treatment. Um, it can commence from people's first cycle of chemotherapy. And um, at Charlie's, we will try and see people when they're admitted for their first cycle and provide them with one of our exercise education booklets to discuss with them and set them an individualised exercise program from that first cycle. The reason this is important is we know chemotherapy is catabolic. And that means that the chemotherapy itself breaks down muscle. So some of the research shows that you can lose between 10 and 15% of your muscle mass per chemotherapy cycle. So if you think that some people have five, six cycles of treatment, this can add up to quite a bit. 
So the aim of exercising during your treatment is to try and maintain your muscle mass as much as we can. We also know with chemotherapy that those side effects that we see where the blood counts drop down often occur sort of um, seven days after people have their chemotherapy. So they might have their um, chemo and feel quite good for the next couple of days, but it's really that week later where they start to feel tired and get some of those side effects. There are some safety considerations that you need to keep in mind while you're exercising during chemo, and I'll talk a little bit more on that in some slides to follow. But the general principle that we tell our patients is just to be kind to yourself. So, you know, those days where you're feeling really flat, we're not expecting you to try and, you know, go to the gym or do your 30 minutes. What we want you to do is be kind to yourself, move small and move often. So we say small amounts broken up during the day is the best way to do it and just avoid excessive rest. Immunotherapies, again, we know exercise is safe um, while you're taking immunotherapy agents. We know that exercise can help reduce particularly fatigue in patients that are having immunotherapy treatments. Um, one thing that can happen, a side effect when some people are on immunotherapy is they can get muscle and joint aches. This doesn't mean you can't exercise, but it does mean that you may just have to modify a little bit what you're doing. And again, you can consult an accredited exercise professional, either a physio or an exercise physiologist um, to help you through that if you're having some trouble. Radiotherapy, again, we know exercise is safe during radiotherapy. There are a few um, slightly different things we would recommend when you're exercising. So we know radiotherapy sometimes can cause skin sensitivity around the area that's being irradiated. So we would just recommend that people monitor their skin, that when they're exercising, they use quite loose clothing. So anything that's tight can sometimes shear against the skin and cause some irritation. Um, and we also know that fatigue can build. So while I said with chemotherapy that it's that seven to 10 days where people start to feel tired, where their blood counts drop, with radiotherapy, it's a bit later. So it builds at about four to six weeks. So again, often people will think, yeah, I'm tolerating this quite well, um, but it might be that four to six weeks later where they start to feel a bit tired. I would encourage you if you um, to just discuss with your radiation oncologist their position around swimming. So it's quite um, individualised, dependent on your doctor with what they recommend. Um, some avoid pools or say to avoid pools during or just after your radiotherapy treatment. And this really, again, is down to skin sensitivity. So the chlorine can sometimes um, cause irritation to the skin. So at Charlie's, I generally tell my patients to avoid the pool um, during or just after their radiotherapy, but it's something you should probably discuss with your individual radiation oncologist. The other thing to monitor for while you're having radiotherapy is joint range of motion. So as I mentioned briefly before, we know that when you're having radiotherapy to a site, you can get some um, tightness of the tissues that overlay that. So if you find that some of the joints or muscles around the area you're getting irradiated get tight, um, again, just um, follow up with someone around that because you may need some stretches or you may need to see a physio for some joint mobilizations once your radiotherapy is finished. So um, yeah, just monitor. The other therapy I wanted to mention is hormone treatment. So these are most common for breast and prostate cancer patients. So what's different about these compared to some of the therapies I spoke about before is that these put you at a slightly higher risk of osteoporosis. It can also sometimes have a side effect of weight gain and fatigue. So when you add these three things together, um, they can often make exercising feel a little bit difficult. But we know that it's really important when you're on these therapies to be including some good resistance exercises. And the reason for that is that doing strength or resistant exercises helps to stimulate bone growth and can help to reduce um, that osteoporotic risk. There's some emerging evidence that doing plyometric exercises, so they're exercises such as jumping, skipping, hopping, can be really beneficial to help stimulate bone growth as well and to get um, reduce that osteoporosis risk. But if you haven't done this before, we would definitely recommend that you see a cancer exercise professional, either physio, exercise physiologist with a background in cancer to get you started on that because it's not something we would um, want you just starting up on your own. 
there's a few reasons when we would tell you not to exercise. So if you've got fevers, if you're unable to eat or drink, or if you've got um, vomiting or diarrhea, then obviously it's good to not exercise on those days. And if you are exercising and you experience any dizziness, any chest pain, any new pain or any unexplained pain or some unexplained shortness of breath, we would recommend that you stop and you um, get a medical review. So the next few slides, I'm going to speak about safety aspects and I'm going to start with blood counts. So as I mentioned, particularly with chemotherapy, we know that seven to 10 days after people have their chemotherapy is where their blood counts start to drop. And there are a few things you just need to be mindful of if you are exercising and this happens. So I'm going to start with platelets. So platelets are really important with blood clotting. And so when your platelets, are, when we exercise, we know that you can sometimes get small tears within the muscle. And this is common and it, it helps to build muscle strength. But when your platelets are low, we want to avoid really heavy weights. So these are guidelines from where I work at Sir Charles Gardner. So when platelets are less than 50, we recommend moderate resistance only. So sometimes we get younger patients through who do CrossFit or um, F45 or um, high intensity interval training. So particularly for those patients, we would say no heavy weights um, when they're less than 50. And again, at Charlie's, we say when they're less than 30, we really only recommend walking. So we say just to um, stop the resistance exercise. This is often slightly different at different hospitals. So again, you can just check, but I think um, is a fairly good guideline to go by. The next is haemoglobin. So the haemoglobin is important for carrying oxygen around your body. So when your haemoglobin levels are low, sometimes people will start to feel a bit dizzy or lightheaded or short of breath. So we say, again, at Charlie's, if the haemoglobin levels are less than 80, then just to stick with walking only and no heavy lifting and just monitor yourself for dizziness and shortness of breath and just move slowly in between positions. With low haemoglobin, sometimes your doctors may consider a blood transfusion, but again, it's very doctor and hospital dependent. I'll talk about neutrophils. So our neutrophils are really important at helping our body fight infection. So when your neutrophils are less than 1.5, you're considered neutropenic and your neutrophil levels shouldn't dictate your exercise. So you can still continue with all the exercises that you would normally do, but we just say to avoid group exercise um, and make sure that you're maintaining good hand hygiene and cleanliness because um, we know that you're slightly more prone to catching viruses and infections when your neutrophils are low. Um, I'll just mention as well, some, there's no reason why if you're unsure about what your bloods are that you can't go and speak to your doctor or your nurse and get them to print them out for you. Um, some of the patients I see in the hospital will say, well, how will I know when my platelets are low? Um, but often patients will just ask to get them printed. And that can be useful not only for exercise, but for, you know, just keeping track of how you go with each cycle and how your blood counts recover. So don't ever feel like you can't ask questions or ask for printouts or ask for further information. Next thing I wanted to talk about is um, bone metastases. So this is where the cancer has spread to bones. And this is probably the patient group that are most worried about exercise, understandably. But what we know from the research is that exercise is still safe and very important when you have bone, metast bone metastases. So it's important for many reasons. One is to maintain your muscle strength, to maintain your bone health at other sites. And we know that this is important, particularly the strength component at reducing your risk of falls. And for that, we also would recommend that there's some balance exercises incorporated into exercise program. So falls can be um, more worrying for patients with bone metastases, because if you fall, you're at slightly higher increased risk of fracture. But again, maintaining your strength and your balance will definitely help reduce risk of falls. If you do have known bone metastases, again, we would recommend that you see a trained cancer exercise professional, either physio or exercise physiologist, to individually tailor a program to you. And a lot of the time we will want clearance from either your haematologist, oncologist or radiation oncologist before starting a program. 
the general principles we go by are just to avoid excessive loading at the site. So if you've got maybe a bone metastasis in your arm, then we would not be doing weights on that side, but you can still do them for your legs and your other arm. Monitor for increasing pain with weight bearing. So when you're on your feet or pain at night, and again, making sure that there's some balance exercises included for falls prevention. I wanted to talk about surgery because I think that's a really important part of people's cancer treatment. Um, but again, it was a bit tricky because if you think about the surgery for someone who's had you know, a mastectomy for breast cancer versus a big laparotomy for colorectal cancer or um, you know, a brain tumor with a craniotomy, the post-surgical pathways are very different for all of them. So I've just sort of taken a bit of a general principles here. So often, particularly for bigger surgeries, you will see physiotherapy post-operatively. And this will be to give you some breathing exercises and to help mobilize you and get you back on your feet. Um, dependent on your surgery, we may also give you some post-operative um, exercises to do and take home as well. To start um, getting back into your normal exercise regime, we normally will get clearance from the surgeon before we do that, particularly if you're having other treatments like chemotherapy, because we know when your blood counts drop, your wound healing isn't normal. So getting that clearance from the surgeon to make sure the wound is all okay before you start exercise is important. Generally, it takes 12 weeks for full wound healing to occur. Um, and we would say, again, start with walking and with all cancer-based exercise generally, I would say small and often is the key. So instead of coming out post-operatively and doing a really, really long walk for an hour and then being really sore that afternoon and the next day, try and break it up maybe into two or three smaller chunks and just see how you feel the next day. Um, small and often is definitely the way to go. Um, keep an eye on your scar. Scar management is important. So Sometimes after 12 weeks, people will say that their scars a bit bumpy, it's a bit tight, um, it's a bit painful. So speak to your surgeon, but that really is not a normal scar response. If you're not happy with your scar, there are some manual therapies we can do to help soften the scar and release the scar. So make sure you let someone know about that. Um, Postural exercises I mentioned are important as well. So again, if you're having surgery, you'll be lying down for long periods. And those muscles that normally keep us upright during the day are um, switched off. So we need to make sure that those muscles around our tummy and back and hips and shoulders are working. I want to talk now about cancer related fatigue, because like I said, the research shows that sort of 70 to 80 percent of cancer patients can experience some form of cancer related fatigue. So this is fatigue that is um, non-relenting, it is not alleviated by rest and it can just be debilitating. People feel like they can't get out of their house sometimes. It's so tiring. We know that exercise has been well researched to help to reduce people's fatigue and give them more energy. But this, again, needs to really be individually prescribed. And the key to exercise for improving energy levels is paced exercise. When we talk about pace exercise, we mean exercise that is broken up with rest scheduled in between. So again, those short, often with rest in between to help to get the energy back. I think cancer-related fatigue isn't only an exercise problem. Um, there's lots of reasons why people have cancer-related fatigue. So we know anxiety and depression can lead to fatigue. So maybe getting a referral to a social worker or a clin psych is important. I work with some great occupational therapists who can talk around fatigue management and how to change your daily activities to help your fatigue levels. Um, and diet is really important as well. Um, and I'll speak about that a bit more later on. The other thing you can look at is activity modification. So if you're finding that you're just exhausted because you have to cook and clean and do all those things around the house, Try and outsource that a little bit if you can. So getting friends and family to help or speak to a social worker to get some services in. Because if you're spending all of your energy on just day-to-day -day activities and you're not doing anything like social or any of your hobbies that bring you joy, um, that fatigue can just get worse and worse. So look at 
um, modifying some of your activities as you can and getting friends to help. Some patients tell me, particularly those that are on the high dose steroids, that they just can't sleep during the day. It's really difficult for them. So if you're having trouble sleeping during the day and scheduling that rest, quiet time is also really helpful. So um, things like meditation, reading a book, if you're crafty and you knit, um, all of those activities are quite good quiet activities. And also yoga is another thing that's been proven to be really helpful with fatigue. And the Cancer Council have a great Life Now yoga program that they run, which you can just Google um, Cancer Council WA Life Now Yoga, and they're free for people that have had um, a diagnosis of cancer within the last, finishing treatment within the last two years. So you can look at that as well. Um, blood pressure. So a lot of patients will have blood pressure fluctuations during their treatment. So um, just watch for that. So some of the symptoms of low blood pressure are dizziness, fainting, and you may hear the terminology postural drops. So that's where your blood pressure drops within position changes. So when you go from lying down to standing up, you might feel really dizzy, get that lightheaded feeling. If that happens, we recommend just moving slowly in between positions and just um, keeping up your hydration. And you'll hear that from everyone. Every nurse, doctor you see will always talk hydration, hydration. It's really important. I'm going to talk next just about the role of exercise in cancer prevention. So as I mentioned, there's so much research being done out there um, looking at the role that exercise has in preventing um, cancer. But I've just picked one article which was published in 2019. So this article um, was a summary of 45 other papers. And it looked, so this is general population, so people before they had a diagnosis of cancer. And they looked at people that adhered to that 150 minutes of exercise per week with the two resistance sessions. And they looked at whether doing that recommended exercise was helpful in um, cancer prevention. And so what they found is the people that did do the recommended 150 minutes with the two lot of resistance exercise in there um, had a significant reduction in all of the following cancers. And you can see the percentages there are actually quite high. So, you know, you're looking at 19% for gastric cancer, uh, esophageal cancer, reduction of risk of cancer for 21%, 19% um, reduction of risk of cancer, colon cancer. So we know that everyone really should be trying to get that 150 minutes of exercise into their week. The next thing I wanted to speak about was the role of exercise in cancer recurrence. So this is a particularly challenging thing, I think, for researchers to look at because we know that all the cancer groups are very different. So breast cancer is different from colon cancer. And then within those cancer groups, there are people at all different stages of their disease and on all different sorts of therapies. But what we know and what I've spoken about already is that exercise does no harm in any of those cancer cohorts. Um, and I've just put one article in my reference there that looked at patients that were diagnosed with cancer and they compared the most active to the least active. And when they did that, they saw a reduction of cancer recurrence by 35%, which is pretty significant. I think just bear in mind when you are thinking of most active versus least active, the most active patients are those that maybe go to the gym five times a week and the least active patients would be those that spend 95% of their day in bed or in the chair resting. So when you think about it from that angle, it's not really surprising that you do see some reduction in cancer recurrence based off those physical activities. Um, diet is definitely not my area, but I just wanted to mention it because I'm really lucky. I work with some fabulous dietitians um, at Charles Gardner Hospital. But what we do know is that protein is a really key building block for muscle. So we can be doing all this great exercise. We know it's beneficial, but we need to also be monitoring our dietary intake. So our dietitians at Charlie's say that they would love a referral if someone has lost greater than 10% 
of their starting weight in their um, weight. So if you have lost greater than 10% of your um, weight from your initial weight, then you can ask your doctor to refer you on to a dietitian. One of the things I hope you take from the talk is to really make sure that you are empowered with your decision making as the patient. So some of my patients feel that they can't ask anyone questions, but you should be asking questions because no one's going to care more about your health than you. So if you want a referral to a dietitian, if you want to see a physio or an exercise physiologist, if you want to see an occupational therapist, ask your doctor and don't be afraid because they'll be happy to make that referral most of the time. Same if you have questions around bloods or treatments, just write them down and ask your doctor because you don't want to be at home and wishing that you had have asked. Um, sorry, if you're listening to the talk and you think this is great, I want to exercise, where do I go from here? There are many great groups around Perth that you can go to. So the Cancer Council have a great resource so you can start by just looking at their exercise for people living with cancer booklet that's got some basic exercises in there that you can start with there's also through cancer council of new south wales some exercise videos again that will just take you through some basic exercises and um, the cancer council wa have a great program called life now and they run um, free exercise classes and also yoga classes for people that have finished their treatment within the last two years. So you can just go on to Google, look at Cancer Council WA Life Now, and you'll see their program and the phone number on there as well, which is, Shannon, thank you, um, 13 11 20. And you'll be able to get put into your closest class. You can also look up um, Pink and Steel Cancer Rehabilitation Physiotherapists. So they're physios that have undergone extra training in cancer rehabilitation um, and they're sort of scattered around mostly Perth Metro, but there are some rural um, physios as well that have done that training. So you can have a look there. The Vario Clinic in Joondalup have an amazing centre up there. Um, they're run by the exercise physiologists. And if you're up that way, they're a great program to look at. There's also PROST, which run for prostate cancer. They're in Leaderville and Crawley. Pink Crusaders, breast cancer in Curtin. Um, and most large centres, so most of the big cancer centres now, will have some sort of um, cancer exercise rehabilitation professional. So you can ask your oncologist, haematologist, radiation oncologist to refer you on to um, someone to help you with an exercise program. When I started to put this talk together, I thought this is such a big topic and how do I know what to put in it? So I went to the experts and I asked my patients what they wanted to know about exercise before I had seen them. And I got some great questions and I thought I'd just pop them in in a slide here. So the first one was, can you overdo exercise? And yes, you can. So I would just um, stick to those safety principles that I spoke about blood work. Um, and bone mets as well. The other thing is just to think about that small and often paced approach. Don't get into the boom or bust. That's what we say you should avoid. So that's where people will wake up and feel like they've got a lot of energy. So they go to the gym and they go for a walk and then they're exhausted for three days. So that is what we want to avoid. And we want to make sure there's small amounts often throughout the day and throughout the week. Can you exercise on your day of treatment? Yes, you can. And there's studies to show that that is safe. But I would just say monitor yourself closely and also be kind to yourself. I think you've got so much going on when you've got a diagnosis of cancer. You don't want to be beating yourself up over not exercising on the day you've had your treatment. So you can, but just be kind to yourself and monitor yourself closely. Can exercise make your cancer cells spread faster? No, it can't. Um, and now what the evidence is beginning to show, particularly in animal models, is that it may actually show the opposite in that exercise can actually slow the growth of your cancer cells. Um, but that hasn't gone as far as I know into um, human studies yet. Should I exercise gently while having chemotherapy? Yes, you should. And just going back to those slides um, that I spoke about with blood counts and avoiding that boom or bust and again, just being kind to yourself. So that seven to 10 days after you have your chemo, 
if you're feeling really sick and you need a couple of days off, that is okay. Um, just come back into it slowly again because we want to make sure that you are moving and you are exercising, but just be kind to yourself as well. Just want to acknowledge um, Lou James from Pink and Steel International who helped me with a few of the slides. And my references. And that's it. So just see if there's any questions. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation, Jill. Um, you really did manage to capture all aspects in um, a really short amount of time. I know it's hard to try and cover everything, but you did a fabulous job. Um, so I'll just open it up to um, everyone online. So if you do have a question, please type it in the box, in the Q&A box. Um, I can't see any at the current moment. So I might just kick it off with one quick one. Um, so I was quite curious to know um, if there is any particular cancer types that are more associated with being less physically active than others. Um, I was quite curious about that. I wonder if you have any... I think generally overall we know that um, most people with a cancer diagnosis, I think I mentioned between one third and two third are inactive and not meeting physical activity guidelines. So. I think um, it's fairly well across the board um, for all cancer types. And there's lots of reasons for that. We know that the cancer itself makes you tired, the treatments make you sick. But um, again, all the evidence I've spoken about just shows the many benefits of exercising. So um, yeah, it's across the board. Yep, fabulous. I uh, can't see any other questions coming through at the current moment. No, I think you're off the hook there, Jill. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you once again for giving up your time this evening. Um, that was really fabulous um, to really, you know, see, show the benefits of exercise um, and what can be done. Um, and just, uh, I know you mentioned earlier, but Cancer Council, we also do have the Life Now program. Um, so if you'd like more information, please visit our website or you can call the 13 11 20 um, line hotline there and um, you can find a course exercise course that's near you um, and we will send out an online evaluation this evening so please fill that in it'd be great to hear your thoughts um, uh, to determine our future education webinars um, we've also we'll be popping this one online on our web page so um, stay tuned for that and um, once again thank you for joining in this evening and I hope you enjoyed it thank you Jill Thanks, Shannon.